So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we uh, are uh, being joined here today at Entrepreneur India and APAC. Uh, we're talking to Jay Vijayan, who has uh, revolutionized in a very different way the entire process of auto retailing and technology services. Um, particularly, what is uh, a key point to note is that uh, his entire SaaS technology and the services which are accompanying uh, it has enabled dealers and manufacturers to sell and service vehicles in the most simple, secure, and most importantly, contact free way. And this is, of course, all, you know, what is uh, important to note is that they're providing a great customer experience as well to customers through the technology. Uh, in this pandemic, you know, when we have all been sort of troubled by how we are going to go and do that one small purchase, whether it was for a vegetable or something as meaningful as auto, which is always a big decision for any family or a business, um, I think um, it's great to have Jay joining us as he tells us about how Techion has been able to achieve uh, this during the time of the pandemic and not just that but also grown the company to become a billion dollar company in probably the fastest time even for a Silicon Valley company which is just four, uh, four years less than four years in fact they started in 2016 and not we're not even at the end of 2020 right now so welcome uh, Jay it's lovely to have you here with us join um, at Entrepreneur and you know it's it's such a wonderful journey to see that you know you what you have built in such a small period of time uh, and uh, done it so beautifully just in a matter of three and a half years, almost close to four, but, um, you know, achieving that kind of uh, orbit in auto industry is, is absolutely a delight. And we would love to know more about how you've really done it. So let me start by asking you a simple question that, you know, traditionally we have seen that when auto dealerships, particularly they have these fanciest, you know, state of the art designer showrooms and, you see that you know uh, the, it's like the entire swanky thing that they sell along with the auto that you are looking to buy. So do you feel that particularly with the kind of product that you have developed, the future of all these auto dealerships or showrooms is likely to be, uh, or people buying from there is likely to be much lesser and they would prefer to buy mm -hmm. digitally or online. And you know, how are you going to match that or how are you trying to match that mm -hmm. experience <laughs> of the yeah. Dealership at Techion to ensure that customer is able to sort of get that kind of service there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Ritu. I'm uh, you know, glad to have this conversation with you. Um, thanks for thanks for inviting, and I appreciate uh, the the kind uh, introduction. Um, going to your uh, question, uh, see, you're you're right. Um, this is not just in um, you know India, but also um, in the U.S. as well as globally. <clears throat> Um, I think for over decades, uh, several decades, I think the, I mean, I would say even a century, this is how it's been operating where, you know, you have a traditional showroom where customers go and buy. And as you, uh, you may have seen online purchasing is increasing, but again, the, the, the biggest thing is in today's world, customers expect convenience and choice, two things. Okay. They want, of course, convenience includes experience. They want easiest the best experience they could get. And in all of our other worlds today, if you want to shop in, you know, e-commerce like Amazon or in India, probably Flipkart and any other e-commerce site, things have gotten really easy, very simple, easy for you to, in few clicks, you place an order and it gets delivered to your home. No issues without even shipping cost in most of the time. But in, in automotive, um, that has, has not been possible yet, except for maybe some places. There are used car online providers, but there is no global. You have great brands that is uh, that are selling great cars, but at the end of the day, the experience of buying a car or servicing a car has not been great. And this is something, as you know well, um, pretty much it's either people own or it's their dream to own always an automobile, right? After housing, automobile is kind of it's a global um thing for people to feel that, you know, they own an asset um, after housing. So um, I think it's, it's been a long view to change that experience to make sure you, so think about this, automobile is second, most of the time, second largest purchase any um, person would make most of the time. After your housing, that's the biggest money that you would put in terms of uh, dollars or rupees. So if you think about today, buying that, but that buying experience is, it's not pleasant many times, even though you have good feeling of when you start say, buying, a, buying a vehicle, but experience of going through that is not great today because 
when you go to a showroom, even after doing all the research, the same thing in the US, it takes easily four hours to eight hours to finish a purchase. And most of these four to eight hours is spent in things that are not pleasurable or not pleasant. It is more, you know, price haggling, it is documentation. There is no even easy way to pull the documentation. You forget 10 things and you have to run around, go get documentation. You have to call multiple people, you know, your whatever it is, pan card. It's not digital. So in today's digital world, it should be easy. Even if you spend four hours in a dealership, think about this. That four hours or majority of the four hours should be spending in what is pleasant and pleasurable. That means you see the car, right? You experience the car, you do a test drive. If you take your family and kids, let them spend time, ask about options. So that is how a purchasing experience should be, not in all the other things, right? Of course, dealerships and OEMs are all, they are in this in terms of doing a business. So it's, it should be a win-win. They should still make money and may be profitable so that they can continue to exist and continue to grow. At the same time, customers can get a great experience as well. Because in, 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 in the technology world, companies like Apple has already shown this, right? Apple has probably the most expensive many times products, but still they're able to sell. What is the reason? Because they have showrooms as well and they can do both online and showroom. So they, they do that digital convergence very well. That doesn't exist in the automotive industry as cleanly. There is so much friction because the OEMs run different set of systems. The dealers run different set of systems. Even within a dealership, there is like in the US, I can see easily 30, 40, 50 different point solutions. Yeah. And they don't talk to each other well. And they, they create more friction in that process, both service and um, selling. So what you thought through, that's something I've seen from my Tesla world to um, what I'm doing now, I felt, you know, there is a, there is a need to solve this problem. Um, and we, that's, that's why we took that heavy lifting of building a platform that is truly comprehensive and runs not superficially just bringing OEM dealers and consumers together, but truly be the operating platform for conducting business. Sure. Uh, so that's what we have built uh, from 2016 to now. We are really, really thrilled about how well everything has come together and also um, the validation that we have been getting from the industry. No, I think that's that's super fantastic. And understandably, the, the you know, the, your services are still available in North America uh, largely. And, you know, there is a whole world yeah. waiting for you to sort of uh, bring this adoption. Correct. Yeah, we are excited. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, and I can imagine, you know, that unicorn status is going to go into multiple times unicorn once you start doing it. Yeah, but, um, you know, definitely. Um, so, you know, you so when you have started uh, talking to these auto companies about, um, you know, go digital or sort of try to give a more digital experience to a customer. So where did you see the first traction coming? Was it, was it you know, mm -hmm. this market segment of auto or was it more like luxury auto? Uh, so who were the early adopters of the technology? Yeah, no, um, yeah, no, no such specific segment, but I think the early adopters were a um, set of dealers and a um, couple of OEMs. Okay. Yeah. So the, the great thing for us, it was not easy. The first two years were the toughest time for us as a company. Mm, mainly, of course, um, people, the, the challenges we had were a few things. Because this industry, as old it is, there were so many barriers to, right. for us to cross and break. And a lot of legacy way of doing things, and people have gotten used to it, and they'll feel comfortable in doing what they've been doing, even though that's not the best way to do things. Everything from selling a car to servicing a car to engaging with the customer, all of those. Yeah. So it took a lot of time for us to convince people there is a better way to do this. And... And we started showing, as we built the product, we started showing the you know, MVP, the pilots and prototypes. Uh, the initial breakthrough came in um, uh, few dealers who were, you know, felt, you know, this is innovative and this is going to help change their business. And they said, you know what, we are ready to start adopting it, even in spite of challenges. Some of the challenges were, you know, um, without OEM certification, you can't roll out the product into dealerships. Yes. And OEMs were initially not willing to talk to us because we didn't, I think, get to the right people. The process was 
over a, over decades the process is very complicated it takes time they won't even talk to you until you get to like you know certain number of dealerships um, on board so it's we have that chicken and egg problem where you can't roll out to any dealers because it's a critical system if you don't have the certification but oems would say we won't even talk to you until you have like you know 50 or 100 dealers on board on the platform finally we were able to show that to the right people in the oem exec the oem executives and oem management once the the biggest breakthrough came in once they see the product they immediately feel the value they so it took time for us to get to the right people and show them you know what this is what the vision is and this is what the product looks like and this is what it will look like in a in a year or two years once they saw that they feel like um, yes this is going to change the industry and yeah we'll we'll help you we'll be part of you of course still they some of the oems approach it very skeptical because they've seen for many decades many companies tried and failed so they were even though they they loved what they saw they wanted to make sure is, is this real is this going to really succeed can they really scale uh, so t- they started taking small steps then the small steps slowly because we were able to deliver beat expectations all the time the, the nice thing is every time when we will show a demo to a oem team like you know every it will be somewhere between 3 to 6 months they will be blown away by the progress we have made they will always um, we have a big surprise telling that wow i mean you guys made this much progress in this short time frame then they started small steps became big steps and then it became real partnership then investment and all of those sure no that that's really super and i mean given given the fact that you know you've been able to achieve the success in north america do you see similar problems happening when you go to other markets markets like europe markets like asia mm-hmm. um, because you know here too the dealership model is uh, Uh, is very strong for right. auto sales correct so, um or do you sort of particularly because these markets are a little different from north america uh, and i would say some some bits not as progressive as north america so do you foresee or what forecast any different problems or challenges uh, entering these markets um there is going to be different sets of challenges but uh, there are two things i think we have as a great advantage uh, the advantage one is the platform truly the first and only platform as far as i know i've not seen any platform in europe i've not seen at least so far in even in asia we yeah. are the only platform that have the complete end to end cloud native capabilities because when i say cloud native that helps us to move to different markets very quickly right um unlike in the past and all of the players have seen are many um more on premise solutions that is being now hosted in the cloud the capabilities are very uh, limited for us truly it's a tech stack developed cloud native so it's very easy for us to spin a new you know um public cloud instance in a region that we wanted to go really serve so platform is a big advantage where we have translations localizations and all of those the second advantage we have is um because of the platform um the what we have the barriers we have crossed in the us it's the same barriers in in other regions also same thing it's just that there is going to be we, we don't have to now that we have done it we know what to do so it makes it a little bit more easier for us to work with the regional uh, there are regional oems but the good news is there are majority of the oems are global as you think about even our investor portfolio um if you think about renault nissan mitsubishi renault is very large in europe um bmw is a global brand uh, right fca is a global brand so we so we have a few things that we can um really use it to get a start much faster and yeah we are excited about this opportunity we are looking at europe we are looking at asia 2021 would be a start for us it won't be a big scale but that might be a start for us um in um, europe and potentially in asia so we are looking at a few um partnerships uh, so once we have the right level of partnership then we'll we'll move uh, quick and i mean uh, considering the fact that so many oems and dealers have now sort of adopted this model what behavioral changes have you noticed uh, for dealers who have been mm-hmm. adopting the technology model you know in terms of their teams in terms of 
the way they approach business mm-hmm. uh, how how what are how are they doing things differently now that's a great point um great point uh, you know uh, dealers definitely are seeing the change that is happening around them mm-hmm. okay so the they see industry is moving consumers are see irrespective of what businesses think consumers want what they want right if you think about you or your friends or your family they will go buy the product where it is much easier for them and where they like doing business with so i think smart business people get it and dealers most of the dealers are relatively smart business people they they are smart business people so they see the change oems are seeing the change they need a platform like this what was been if you think about this the biggest thing they have been lacking is a technology platform right. they have everything else if you think about they have they have inventories right which is tough to get the tough vehicle inventories from the oems only thing is again there are the technology friction is there there is no good transparency on inventory when it comes when it goes all of those um so those those needs to be cleaned up they have the inventory they have the real estate to store the inventory they have the capital and then finally they are in the community so they are connected to the community so i think if we converge both digital and showroom make sure it becomes seamless you give choice to the customer to say okay if you want to do 100% buying online and get the car delivered to your home we will do it they don't have to go to another provider to do it if you're in the community if you're part of that same brand if you like a particular brand that you want to go buy as a consumer for me or for you it should be seamless whether you go to you know bmw main website or if it routes you to a local dealer website for you the experience should be just seamless you you shouldn't feel any different for you or you shouldn't feel like you know what okay enter your information and someone will reach out to you and most of the time that is where you lose the business literally because many times people don't reach out or you don't want to have a call coming into you you have to make all the choice and then finally you want to interact with someone at your um um choice how you want to do it so d- dealers are seeing that um they, they they do want to go to digital and but they've been lacking in the industry what i have seen over the years dealers have been purchasing so many different solutions expecting this will solve their problem right. but unfortunately it just adds to the friction they keep buying small 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 tools like you know texting and exchanging text to customer is a tool like you know what um selling finance and insurance is a different tool so everything they used to buy different different tools now that all goes away pretty much everything comes together in one platform removing friction and then experience also improves significantly so from a dealer point of view they are going more digital they are training their staff definitely how to so the way we have created is we have created not only 100% online buying but if in, in between your online buying experience if you feel as a customer you want to talk to someone right you're going through the you you're clicking through you're looking at cars and say you're 50 60% into it but suddenly you don't find some options that you want to choose you don't find some colors you want to choose or you don't find the pricing that you want to choose so now in today's world only way is either you call someone many times that doesn't handshake properly or you go to a dealership which is not a great experience all the time at your choice you can one click you can initiate a virtual session with the dealership mm. so this is where you need additional training a sales manager can sit in a dealership literally seeing a customer call coming online they can do a virtual session with the customer and do a virtual handshake and walk them through the process they can do the same selling of additional options additional accessories finance and insurance all of those virtually to them mm. in you know via their computer they can do screen sharing and do everything so those are much more innovative ways and giving options to the customer to the the consumer to purchase a vehicle in the best way they think is is good for them so that's kind of how we have changed in those areas where the the dealership are willing to definitely train their staff in for in fact it is much easier for them to train that way mm, because initially there is a there is a little bit of a mental block for them to get over it once they see how simple it is they can still sell more they can get more commissions paid at the same time make the customer happy 
then they realize, wow, okay, this is, this is easy. So I can still do what I'm doing. I can still make money and I can still make my customers happy and loyal. So I see a good trend changing there, but it's going to take a lot of work for us to educate them and train them and hand them, um, yeah, handle them during the transition. Surely. And I mean, you know, where have you seen volumes uh, uh, within dealerships happening? Was it in two, two wheelers or whether it was in four wheelers or commercial vehicles? So are, are you doing hmm. the entire spectrum or are you sort of uh, right now at Techion uh, sort of saying that we'd only deal with certain segments of auto? No, no uh, yeah, we are, we are fully into, um, uh, right now the focus is a lot on the consumer segment. Hmm. Because dealers should sell both consumers and they sell fleets as well. So anything that dealers should do or platform takes care of it. You know, hmm. end to end, if you think about the consumer experience, you know, buying, selling a car, servicing, maintaining, consumer engagement. Then if you take all of those internally, then the complete process of getting a deal, a vehicle deal um, built to it with everything, leasing, financing, insurance options, lender connections, um, e-signing, online you know, signing, then pushing the whole deal to processing it to general ledger, accounts payable, accounts receivable. So the whole back office functions, everything comes together in one, one single um, platform. So they can do warehouse management, they can do parts, parts inventory, vehicle inventory, so everything. So either they sell it to the consumer or sell it to fleet. In the U.S., if you think about dealers, do both. The same dealer does sell to consumers to most part. They also do sell business to business. So they do sell to fleets and they do sell parts as well many times. And our platform takes care of the whole thing. Sure. And I mean, do you also sort of, uh, so what, what's the entire process from where you sort of uh, take over? I mean, are you involved in the sales process also? Because one of the area that concerns the dealers is how is he going to bring volumes from his own dealership? Uh, so, I mean, mm -hmm. what part uh, do you play over there? And secondly, even in terms of after sales mm -hmm. service. So, uh, are there yeah. with there? Okay. Yeah, if, if I um, understand your question right, you're asking how does the platform help increase sales for the dealers, correct? Is that from the what question? Point to what point does the process work? Uh, I mean, does it start ah. after the sale or does it sort of start right before the sale? So it helps to identify the hmm. customer for sale. And what about after sales service as well? Great question. Correct. It, it does every part of the consumer journey. So it does start from campaigning. So we have campaigning, the dealerships can start creating campaigns and send out campaigns to customers. When you say campaigns, you know, it could be Diwali promotions that are happening, right? It could be New Year's promotions. So the platform, you can create campaigns and send out to customers. From the campaign, the whole sales process, the customers can click and ask for information, which is, goes into, again, our system, the whole customer engagement system or they can click to the dealer website and start shopping for a car. And then the whole process of shopping, buying online or making a choice and then coming to the dealership and the whole process of buying. So the complete journey is done in one platform. So every part of the journey is done. There are some parts of the journey we connect with some other partner systems. So for example, um, lender system. So we have to connect through um, middle layer company, which yeah passes on to lenders, so multiple lenders. So that so there are a few areas, but the core operation for a, from a dealer point of view or from a consumer point of view, they do only one system. It's all go, th go through our platform. Right. And do you have after-sales service too? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, everything. So after-sales service is also very easy. Everything from a booking and appointment, everything is in our platform. So if you... Um, if you're a customer, if you go to the dealer website, sometimes even if you go to the OEM website, based on your location, it will route you to the local, the local dealer's uh, appointment booking. The appointment booking engine is ours. So you book an appointment through Techion platform. The nice thing is it is all interconnected. When yeah. you as a customer drive to a dealership, we know who you are. We recognize the vehicle. We sometimes, many times we connect to the vehicle uh, as well and say, okay, um, Ms. Um, Ritu, welcome to so-and-so dealerships and your service advisor um, 
it will name the person if you have chosen someone and says he will he'll be with you very shortly. And then the first time we have done a complete mobile experience, so someone service advisor would come to you with a mobile phone which will have all your information, your vehicle information, and then they will go through the service experience with you. The nice thing is if you are in the dealership for a quick oil change, you need to go wait for like say 30 minutes. If you go and wait in the lounge of the dealership, the displays, all the digital displays are all connected to our cloud and connected to the backend system as well. So you can literally see the status of your car in the TV while you're watching the program in the side, it will show you the live status of where your car is in the service process. That way you're always informed. If you're sitting in front of the TV, but not watching the TV, but if you're looking at the phone, your phone is also connected. So there is a connected customer portal for you, which you can track the status of the car, you can do the payments. So the whole process end-to-end -end experience is connected through our platform. No, I think that's great. And I mean, I give it the fact that, you know, you've done such great connectivity for the entire dealership model. Do you see that this is a model that you can also take to other industries? CPG industries has such a big dealer network and then the franchise industry is so big in North America anyway. So do you see uh, it sort of extending itself to other industries as well? Definitely, definitely. So we had, we kept that in mind. Uh, that's how we developed the platform. So the, the reason I keep mentioning is this is a true platform. It's not a one-off application for one particular use case. Um, so it's a true cloud platform, easy to configure to any industry. Of course, there will be work involved for us to understand an industry, make sure that the workflows and everything is configured to the right industry. But right now we have a massive opportunity in automotive industry for us, as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's a pretty much the largest consumer industry in terms of dollar volume in the world. So I think we, we have a massive opportunity in the automotive industry, but once we are at a certain phase where we are in a steady stream of growth, then we will start focusing um, other, uh, other industry verticals also. So have you looked at the possibilities of open sourcing the, uh, the technology for others to develop technology for other industries? Not yet, not yet. Um, may, maybe in the future, but not yet. Yeah, we haven't really, honestly, haven't thought, thought about it yet. Sure. And I mean, you've recently raised a big a round of funding, your Series C funding for about $150 million, mm -hmm. which also sort of brought the valuation to the unicorn status. I mean, you know, so now becoming a unicorn and becoming a unicorn so fast uh, in Silicon Valley, what, what has been your learning as an entrepreneur? And you know, how do you want to deploy this funding towards? What, what would be the aim for uh, this yeah. funding? Yeah, uh, very, very good question. <clears throat> the, the learning has been, um, I would say, you know, um, we've been fortunate to be where we are and um, we are putting in tons of hard work. In fact, um, after the funding round, um, it's been a few months now. In fact, we've been working harder now, um, even more and more harder to make sure that, you know, we live up to the expectations of um, our customers and our investors both. Uh, so um, the early days is, I think we, I should thank my team, which has been a phenomenal team staying with us through. There are like great people who have been through with the company with very tough times. There are people who early days, will come to me and say, you know, Jay, can I take less salary and can I get more stocks in the company? Mm -hmm. And which is, uh, you know, which is a, such a nice thing to hear um, for an entrepreneur because early days, uh, some of the founding team members, uh, we didn't even take salary um, it, we, because it, we wanted to put every single uh, dollar we can put it into the company to, to grow the company. And it's nice to see that people believe in the company that strongly. In fact, especially in the early days, we went through so many challenges um, in, uh, in breaking the barriers. It was tough times. I think the, uh, the, the big learnings for us is stick to the core um, what you're solving. Keep uh, always a medium to long-term view. Long-term view is what I would always suggest. When I say long-term view, it doesn't mean you, you move slow. You move really fast to Correct. make progress and deliver interim. But your view should be long-term. When you build something, you should think about this product should exist for decades to come. Right. Not like, you know, 
this year i'll be number one and then after that i'll just fall down i don't we don't want that to be you want to be really innovative company constantly innovating innovating and growing the first two to three years were the toughest because a lot of people did say why are you taking so much why would you develop um this much why do you why can't you take because uh, you have technology expertise why don't you take one problem and solve it this is a very common thing i've heard from investors i think their advice in one perspective is right but it's not right for everyone because for me the way i saw this is a what problem we are solving for the industry the industry already is fragmented there is already 50 applications people are using so we are solving one of the biggest problem we are solving is fragmentation second problem by removing fragmentation we want seamless experience for customers end to end so to do that whatever it takes if it takes heavy lifting let's go do this and i think that's the biggest part i think we lined up make sure that the vision is very clear the clarity in delivering to your team what are the, what is the bigger picture and what are the goals every six months what do you need to solve to continue to make progress then the next part is aligning people you need you need support if you're disrupting an industry this big you need people from the industry supporting you and validating telling that you're solving the right problem i think that was the second thing and we were lucky to do that that's why we got this many oem brands as part of our investors it's much much more than money for me it's it's more the validation that they bring right telling us you know you're solving the right problem for the industry and dealers as well then dealers coming and investing big dealer groups coming and investing so i think all of the learnings we were able to really apply quickly and continue to move in the right uh, trajectory the other learning is some of the things that we thought um you know easy for example the adoption um the consumer adoption and um, and the, the the best part for us is we apply the learning very very quick um the consumer adoption was a bit of a challenge in early days and i say that we are a very intuitive application so our application is unlike the applications in the industry usually in this industry if you go people usually need like 3 months to 6 months training to use an application yeah. okay so for me that was kind of bit crazy why do you need so if think about simple example Amazon does billions and billions of dollars of business. They are a trillion dollar company. Okay, so they do consumer, they do B to B as well. Mm-hmm. In the last twenty years, I've seen Amazon. I've never heard anyone saying I took one month training on how to use Amazon. Yeah. Right? That never happened because the product is so easy and simple and intuitive. Because you then I felt my team from yeah. So my, to my team, that's what I told. You know what? If that is the case. our application should be intuitive enough for the businesses as well where they shouldn't take like this many months training we can build it it's not uh, i have done it in the past uh, past life as well so that's how we built it it became super super easy to for consumers to use every part same as their mobile app but at the same time as you know businesses are businesses they have complex processes even though if you give simple application there is rule sets to configuration to set up you know tax calculations different things so there are so many things those are the learnings that we had to go through but we applied it very quickly because every county every state tax and regulations vary so you yeah. need to set up those things in the right way and then there is a small amount of training not 3 months training but it's even 3 hours training sometimes it takes 3 days but that's the max so we go through a, we have set up a very nice training process both online and in person based on the dealer's requirement so we do a very nice training now and it becomes much easier and smoother transition um for us to for us to go through so it's been great now now we are in a phase where the demand is coming in significantly both dealers and oem now we are all focused on scaling the business to the next next step sure and um i mean you know um uh, the you know i've also read that you were a cio at tesla before you started techion uh, yourself mm-hmm. so what what were the gaps that you saw at tesla that sort of became sort of a a ground or put a foundation for you to start techion so uh, mm-hmm. in the auto industry what was it that you had noticed at that point of time yeah yeah if you see when we started building um or uh, started building and before after we built so when we started building the tesla's platform i had an opportunity to see what 
the industry uses. Just to see, you know, what, what, is, what is the industry is using? Because Tesla is, of course, very, very, very small at that time and then growing. So in a, in a, in a grand scheme of things, Tesla was a um, fraction of the industry, 0. 0.3, 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3%. This was like, you know, in 20, 2012, okay, or less 2012, 2013, very, very small, just starting. So when I compared to the industry, which is like 99.56%, 7% of the industry, I saw very obvious, for me, it was a fresh eyes, right, coming outside and people who are in the industry, they're used to, you know, if you have to sell a car by going through 100 steps, that's how they've done it for decades. They'll continue to do the same thing again and again. It's like a muscle memory for them. Even they may not even realize how complicated it is. As a customer, you may realize how complicated it is and you may feel like, oh, man, why should I go through all of these things? To Because I'm ready to pay money. I know what car I want to buy, but why are you asking me to jump through so many hoops? But from a business point of view, not all the time they have that um, realization. So from a fresh eyes, I was able to see, me and my team were able to see all the complexities. So consciously at, uh, at Tesla, we said, you know what, we're going to remove as many friction as we, we can remove and make the experience easy and simple for the customers. Then my thought is, okay, if we're able to do this in a smaller percentage, why can't the same thing can be done for 99.7% of the, the rest of the people, right? So, but again, I, that said, it, it sounds easy, but as you may, you can imagine, it's very complex. It's not here, it was like one company, one, their own, you know, dealership. There it's like multiple brands, tons and tons of dealerships, each dealership its own business. So there is, the complexity is significant. But at right. the same time, opportunity is also big, right? So I'm sure you've heard this, where, the bigger the challenge and the bigger the problem you solve, the bigger the reward and the, the op bigger the opportunity and bigger the reward is. Okay. So by that we thought, you know what? Yes, there is an opportunity to go solve this. Remove the friction in this process because day in and day out, consumers buy cars. They service their cars, they engage. It happens all the time. And looking at the economy size where, you know, just in North America, I talked about, right? Um, the vehicle ecosystem is almost a trillion dollars. So it's a 4%, somewhere around 4% of GDP, US GDP, which is $850 billion in 2019, right? So US GDP is $21 trillion and 4% uh, is almost $850 billion in just vehicle sales. And if you take the whole ecosystem of the service and everything else, it's a trillion dollar ecosystem every year that goes through. So I felt, you know, that's, that's big. So we can deliver a platform to serve this. And even if there is a good percentage we can win, then that's a phenomenal business for us to sustain and grow. So that's kind of how we approach. And I felt, you know, um, there was a very clear, um, I would say, visibility to the problem. And we formed a great strategy and a good plan to go solve it. And that's what Techion and Techion Automotive Retail Cloud is. Uh, that's wonderful. And so finally, let me ask you this, that, you know, how has the unicorn mm -hmm. status helped Techion to, um, I mean, grow or, uh, you know, be able to think bigger than what you were thinking previously? I mean, what, what changes has it brought for you personally as an entrepreneur and for Techion as an organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, good question. See, we kept our platform and the company relatively under the wraps until we announced this. So we mm. kept it very, very silent. A lot of people ask, like, uh, uh, it's a surprise that you guys didn't even, we didn't even know you, you guys existed. People also said, even from the automotive industry, one of the OEM executives said, you know, this is the best kept in secret in the automotive industry, how <laughs> you were able to. And it was a very conscious decision. We did that because we didn't want to go, you know, uh, talk about ourselves. And I was very clear that the first, our customers, our product should speak for itself and our customers who are dealers and OEMs should speak for it. Uh, once we have the validation, then we will go announce to the market and then it will make it much easier for us to scale. 
And that's exactly what we have done. I think the um, announcement has done a great job for us to spreading the brand name. Now people know we exist, even though previously it was all word of mouth. We had like phenomenal traction through mm. the through word of mouth. Mm. But now everyone comes to know. So for me, I'm getting like, you know, almost every day, every week we get inbound requests, customer requests. Dealers are reaching out, OEMs are reaching out, investors are reaching out. So right now it's about balancing and prioritizing it. What is important for the company? who's going to be helping us to the next level. And that's where we're going to spend our time on. So it's been great from a um, um, brand awareness perspective, the unicorn status. Capital is good. We've been a very disciplined company and a very disciplined operations. We have tons of capital in the bank. Our revenue is also increasing. So we are, our goal is to be fully positive cash flow in 2022. Um, and then still we'll have a lot of money in the bank and we are investing for the right reasons. Um, enhancing and accelerating some of the product features and then hiring for the scaling, go to market. Uh, so those are the two areas we are uh, spending our capital. Okay. Well, at this point, you should say about the billion dollar thing about, you know, sales and all, so we can wrap it up from there. Yeah, actually, you know, how to say um, as you and I briefly chatted before we started the interview, for us, it's gratifying to get this billion dollar in valuation. But I definitely and strongly feel internally, I've discussed this with my team, while we feel happy about the valuation, um, I will feel significantly more thrilled when we get to a billion dollar in revenue. Because... Um, Thanks to our investors who have given us the valuation, believing in that we will, we will step up, right? So for me, I've, uh, I think, mentioned this internally as well with, with a lot of money comes, you know, a lot of power, with a lot of power comes a lot of responsibility. So we, I feel we have a lot more responsibility on our shoulders to live up to this billion dollar valuation and then scale from here to become a multi-billion dollar company and sustain for next. Uh, decades to come. Sure, and I think we're looking forward to you going out to newer markets and reach out to markets in Asia as well as India and of course other parts of the world and we wish you all the very best as you grow forward and surge your company forward um, and hopefully next time we look forward to having you here in India and Asia in person and not on the confines of a screen as we come to know more about your product and really get to see a grand presentation of you presenting uh, how the industry is. Absolutely. For joining us. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ritu. I really, yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation and hopefully I do visit like every, you know, um, three to four months. I used to, I should say, until COVID. Hopefully if everything is behind us, then I'll have my routine visits and looking forward to doing a um, meeting and a presentation as we grow to the next, next level. Thank you so much. Yeah, wonderful talking to you, Jay. Great talking to you. The recording now. <laughs> and no, I think uh, as I can know more about your product, it's fantastic. I think what you're doing. You know, I was while you were talking, I was thinking. I mean, uh, if you follow India and in 